Let's start. Uh, so this evening I wanted to talk about process theology. It's a relatively modern area of theological thought, although like most theologies, it, it does have its roots in history. Uh, it goes back and uh, but it's 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 there and um, so it's an opportunity for us to explore things differently. Uh, and it, it's in its modern form, it's, uh, it responds to a philosopher math mathematician, I nearly couldn't say mathematician, it responds to a philosopher mathematician who uh, was, was sort of looking at the interrelatedness of things. And so if you think of a uh, sort of the, the, the Cartesian timeline of the universe, if you will, where um, the, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is space and everything kind of explodes out from the origin point uh, and space is sort of the y-axis and over time it get, the universe gets bigger and bigger, uh, which is a fairly broadly accepted picture of kind of how you might depict time and space. And there's all sorts of really great images out there. So as part of that, every moment then that occurs within this time-space universe that we all live in is kind of in the process of being formed and in the process of unraveling at the same time. And, and some, you know, the easiest way to think about it is um, for me to have been born required a process and required a process of my parents meeting and my dad meeting my mum uh, and apparently at a picnic, at a church picnic, I'm told. I don't know if I trust that story. Uh, and so my birth, there's a process that leads up to that and then there's impacts that lead out from that moment. There's a process that leads out. Uh, so there's the process, the imp impact on, on me as an existing human being. Um, but there's, ex there's, a, there's an impact on my parents, there's an impact on my teachers, and they impact on me and I've impacted on them. So there's kind of the back and flow of, of, of relationship and process. And everything affects everything else in that regard. Um, not in some kind of necessarily mystic-y sort of way, but rather just, uh, just as I impacted on people, they impact on me in the same way. And so everything is, there's a kind of a, an ongoing mutability to the entire universe. Because if one thing can, if one thing change, if one, if a thing can impact, it by definition can be impacted. It can change in some way. Um, so that's the Whitehead's picture. That gets picked up in theology. And the question then becomes, how does this then speak to our picture, if you will, of God? Uh, so what I want to do is I want to read from the beginning of Luke. Uh, it's sort of excerpts from Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph went to Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. Isn't that beautiful? So that's the Christmas story that we all kind of are familiar with. Ooh, hang on, bump stuff. So that's a Christmas story we're all familiar with, or well, at least a small excerpt from it. And if we take that seriously, if we take that story seriously as being in some way revealing something of the nature of God, we see a process that happens with Christ that goes from there was a time before Christ was born, incarnated, and there was a time after Christ was incarnated. And that incarnational experience 
impacts people, but it also impacted Christ. It changed Christ's functionality within the universe. And process theology will see that as being true of the very nature of God. So it's very different from the, the kind of the Greek or Platonic picture of God that sees the nature of God as being inherently immutable, inherently unchangeable. In process theology, we get a very different picture of God. We actually get a much more biblical picture of God. We, we see uh, various different places. Okay, so we're going to kind of move through process theology. Um, and there's a loose definition there if you've got the notes. Uh, and it refers to all forms of theology that em emphasize event, occurrence, or becoming over substance. So, <clears throat> with, the, with the kind of the, looking at, say, the event, uh, if we look at the event of, of the universe, uh, rather than being focused on how might we define the very fundamental nature of the universe, there's a question of uh, how might we explore and understand its dynamic, ongoing nature and those sorts of things. And so rather than being focused on uh, what we might say is the very substance of the nature of God, rather your question is the event that we describe as God, uh, what do we do with that? So in process theology, then, there are a number of dominant themes. Uh, and like with all things, you know, some people will, will, will argue one point, others will argue the other point. In the, in the, but within process theology, you're going to get a fair bit of this stuff. And the first is that God is not omnipotent in the sense of being coercive. So <clears throat> omnipotent all-powerful, uh, or omni-powerful. Uh, what does omni mean? Yeah, how do we translate into Greek? Those sorts of things. But this is the, you know, when, when kids ask the question, you know, could God create a rock so big that God can't lift? Uh, you know that question? If, you, if you've ever taught like a grade 10 class or anything like that, that's the question they're going to they're gonna ask. Or um, could God burrito a microwave, uh, microwave a burrito so hot that God can't eat it? Yeah, this is around the question of omnipotence, right? How do we think about omnipotence? <clears throat> In process theology, it's a very different kind of way of understanding power. So it's, it's about God then has the power to persuade, but not to coerce. So God can't force you or me to do anything. God doesn't force the universe into being. The, the, the universe is drawn into being. <clears throat> so um, there, there'd be, so traditionally classical process theologians will interpret kind of the, the, the traditional doctrine of omnipotence as involving force and um, they would suggest that in the very nature of God if nothing else we have a, a withholding of that power. So even if God has the power God doesn't exert that power. Um, so persuasion then is God doesn't act in a unilateral way, but it, but through persuasion, you know, and we we kind of understand persuasion in that regard. Um, going, kind of going back to the uh, the original sort of definition of process th of process thinking and all the rest of it, it's talking about um, so reality is not made up of things. I mean, I know that sounds weird. Reality is not made up of things, um, but it, it's it's kind of it it takes seriously the fact that things are degrade, and so um, when when we talk about a thing, we're talking both we're talking about its its kind of materiality, but also about its moment in time and space. So it, it's kind of very mm, ivory tower philosophical mathematical at this stage um, uh, so so you know we would talk about a thing having a, a sort of a series of events that occur to it now those events can be sliced pretty th fine and you end up with the event that is say life um, uh, and they are experienced events 
In addition to this, there's the notion that God contains the universe, but is not identical with it. So um, for, for kind of the technical language there, panentheism, not pantheism or pandeism. So pantheism is basically the entire universe is the, if you will, the existence of God. So God and the universe are the same thing, more or less. Um, uh, and, and this sort of sees that, that the entire universe is contained within the very nature of God. Um, yeah, all is in rather than all is God. Um, because God interacts with the changing universe, God is changeable. Um, now, that might say things like, uh, you know, God is affected. And we, 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 we read in Scripture, you know, Moses intercedes with God and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and so we see this, that God is affected by the actions that take place in the universe. Yeah, which is fine. Um, yeah, that doesn't necessarily impact on um, the kind of the abstract elements of God. And, we, you know, God is loving, God is good, wisdom, goodness, those sorts of things. So process theology will, will, will separate out or parse out those kind of inherent nature of God stuff and uh, the moment-by-moment -moment movement of God in the universe. Uh, and and, and they'll, they'll, they'll distinguish between those things. And they'll say, in process theology, one changes, and one probably doesn't. So that's... The, the, most process theologians will, will kind of go through that stuff. Um, one of the things that I find challenging in process theology uh, is the, the way they deal with Christ as one of those events in history, one of those uh, serially, or, serially ordered uh, experiential events in history. Um, and that's by suggesting that Christ is um, the most Christ-like example, uh, but not necessarily unique. So perhaps unique in the amount of Christ-likeness that Christ displayed, that Jesus displayed, but not unique. So... Um, so picture, you know, like a Usain Bolt, right? He's pretty quick. Uh, but the, the, the gap between Usain Bolt and I is one of quantity of speed, right? So, I mean, he, he could probably like run around the block three times before I'm finished tying my shoelaces. But it's, a, it's about quantity. Uh, in, in traditional Christian theology... There is a qualitative difference uh, in Christ. It's a, it's a qualitative thing. Um, and using the metaphor of travel and speed, perhaps in, in the case of Jesus, the traditional picture would be that of, of almost of teleportation, where the, it doesn't matter how much speed you have, you can have all the speed there is, and you're still not instantaneous does that make i mean maybe i should have come up with a better metaphor but you know i you understand there's a and and for so so in process theology christ is not is is unique in quantity of of his expression of being the the word of god the the eternal logos um but not necessarily in a kind of in a qualitative way. Um, so, so for me, that's one of the places where I, I just can't go with process theology. I, I believe that there was a qualitative difference in Christ in that moment. I, yeah, uh, I guess we part company there. Um, uh, I don't, yeah, so I, I, other than that, I'm pretty happy with a lot of this stuff. 
Um, now, I also want to talk about uh, process theology and uh, what's called theodicy. So, um, you know the classical problem of evil. If God is omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent, why does evil exist? Um, or, or those sorts of things. I actually think um, I've, I've, I've raised that as an issue previously. Uh, for for process theology, the kind of part of its strength is that in in, in its um, theodicy in its response to that question, there is a lot of variation. So for the, the, the so in process theology, they say there must be real relations in God. Um, and that means that God can uh, have real relations with other beings. There can be love, and there can be pity, and there can be hopes and disappointment, uh, condemnation, forgiveness. Those are all signs, if you will, of a real relationship. Uh, and it makes sense to you know, if uh, thinking about you know family and all the rest of it, uh, if your own kids um, misbehave. That impacts you in a way that if somebody else's kids impact misbehave doesn't. Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense. Um, you know, the, the, it, it, the quality of the relationship, the realness of the relationship, opens you up to the impact of the events, uh, be they joyous, frustration, painful. The realness of the relationship matters, um, and. The Bible often describes God in very relational terms. I mean, not just in terms of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but, you know, as, as a leader, as a shepherd. As, you know, um, so, yeah, there's, there's no reason to think that that's an unreasonable way for a Christian to, to describe God in, in that kind of deeply relational sense. If we go back to that kind of classical Greek-inspired theology, there's a almost an in, a sense in which God is, and the technical technical term is impassable. Nothing can penetrate God. Um, I would suggest that that is not a Christian definition of God. Uh, so yes. Now, if God, nothing can penetrate God then God is not truly moved by people's suffering. But if things can penetrate God in an emotional sense, in a, in a process sense, then God is able to, to walk alongside. Uh, and Whitehead uses the, the, describes God as the great companion, the fellow sufferer who understands. So our suffering is felt by God. So that means that God can suffer, God can feel pleasure and joy. And how that's linked to theodicy is to the, to the response to evil uh, is one, it, by taking out the question of that um, uh, force, the, the coercive force, we don't, we, we have a picture of God who is automatically not going to be just powering overpowering the things of the universe god rather tries to summon and draw and encourage to persuade uh and we also get that god is with us in that journey so um i suppose one of the classical versions of that story comes out of uh um the holocaust and you know people being executed and people and 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 there's a conversation i don't know if it's a true conversation but it's been referenced a number of times there's the conversation that occurs between two people and one says where is god in this and somebody else says you know up there um with the noose around his neck um you know god is in that pain and suffering constantly persuading and calling us as individuals and the universe to a more fulfilling life. So that's process theology in a, in a super nutshell. <laughs>
in a very abbreviated form. What do I like about it? I like that it's got that strong emphasis on the relational nature of God, that God is with us, journeys alongside us, feels for and with us, celebrates with us, mourns with us. That is powerful. That is powerful. It is deeply biblical. It has a very strong reference to the way God is described in Scripture. It accords with our knowledge of how the universe actually operates in a kind of a, uh, in a meta scale. Um, your day-to-day experiences of things, but in a big picture, we kind of understand that things are in, in time and space and they're in a process. We, we, we get that. It's not how we always think, but we get that. Where I don't go is, as I said, the notion that Christ is, that Jesus is just the most Christ-like of all of us, and that the difference is a difference of kind, of, of, of amount, rather than a difference of type. Uh, for me, I just, I think what the, what's described in Scripture is a difference that is greater than that. I hope that gives you a brief insight into process theology. Um, there are some great people out there writing in this area, uh, and... I would encourage you to look at look it up. Uh, thank you, and uh, good night. Well, let's see. Um, I don't see any questions that have come up. Uh, yeah, I feel like there was once again quite a lot of information. Maybe I should be chunking these into smaller bits, um, but I'll finish there. Thank you.